I'm going to bring up the uh, next two panelists. Great. Senator Skinner and Justice Moreno, if you could join us. All right, in the interest of keeping us on schedule, I'm going to plow ahead. Uh, Professor Lerman, are you there? Oh, there you are. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you got to hear a little bit of our past panel. I thought that was exactly kind of um, the conversation that we're looking to have, um, where we really want to hear about your research and your work and your experience and how that, that can translate into very concrete recommendations. Uh, for this committee and then ultimately for the legislature. So glad to have you. Um, our two panelists um, in this panel are Carissa Byrne Hessick. Did I pronounce that correctly? Great. Um, from the University of North Carolina Law School, where she's a professor, and Amy Lerman, who's a professor of public policy and political science at UC Berkeley, Goldman School of Public Policy, and director of the Policy Lab. Uh, professor Hessick, we will begin with you. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've been asked to speak with you about plea bargaining. And when I say thank you for inviting me, I mean, thank you for paying attention to plea bargaining. Because um, as, as you may know, um, substantive criminal law and criminal procedure have a very big effect on what happens in plea bargaining. But it's also pretty clear that plea bargaining can also have an effect on substantive law and criminal procedure, at least how they operate in practice. And so it's very frustrating to me as someone who studies plea bargaining, how often I see policies being contemplated without any thought for how plea bargaining will affect it. Um, in fact, um, I was doing um, a project not related to plea bargaining, related to substantive criminal law. And I was watching um, some, some committee hearings where, where folks in a state, not California, were contemplating the enactment of a new crime, right? A bill to make something criminal. And one of the members of the legislature pointed out that one of the elements for the new crime seemed um, not very well drafted. It was vague, it wasn't clear. Um, how to interpret it. And one of her colleagues reassured her that they didn't have to resolve that because the juries would, you know, come up with their own interpretation when they were trying people for the crime. And everyone seemed to accept that and go along on their merry way. But unless unless a criminal defendant is the lucky one or two out of a hundred that actually gets a jury trial, those sorts of things would not be resolved in a courtroom. They would be resolved sort of quickly in negotiation and potentially unilaterally by a prosecutor. So my goal today is not to rehash the written testimony that I gave in. I've been told that this is a very diligent group that does all of the reading and that you'd be deeply bored if I did that. So instead what I thought I would do is I would simply give you a bit of an analytical framework for thinking about plea bargaining. And by that, I mean, give you a sense of why it is that it appears people plead guilty so that you can keep that sort of matrix or that framework in mind as you think about decisions. Okay, so now that I said I'm gonna give you a framework, I have to take a step back and say, actually, I actually have to split things into two because the truth is plea bargaining looks really different if somebody's being accused of a very serious crime that carries a serious penalty, or if a person is been accused of a less serious crime that carries a, a, a much smaller penalty. Both of these things are important. Um, some of the statistics that you saw um, in the staff memo show you that an awful lot of crimes actually are you know, misdemeanors or infractions. So the penalties that they carry aren't very large. So it's important to understand the plea bargaining dynamics in both groups. Okay, let's start with uh, serious crimes that carry serious penalties. The overarching thing to keep in mind here 
is that there's usually a very big difference between how a defendant is treated if the defendant insists on going to trial or if the defendant pleads guilty. And that difference has different names. Um, some people call it the trial penalty. Other people call it the plea discount. You can probably tell how they feel about it based on which of those terms that they use. But the, the point is that that differential creates an incentive for people to plead guilty, but an incentive can also be something that doesn't just incentivize, but, but sort of makes them feel as though they have to plead guilty, that the difference might be so big that the risk of going to trial isn't worth it. Um, so uh, this differential is often thought of as the leverage that prosecutors have in the plea bargaining process. So the bigger that differential is, the more leverage that a prosecutor has and the more likely a defendant is to plead guilty. Uh, so mandatory minimum sentences often give a lot of leverage, but so do high sentences in particular because there's just sort of more room for there to be a big difference between what happens at trial and what happens when someone pleads guilty. Um, I should note, by the way, it's not always just a difference in sentence. It can also be a difference in terms of what the person pleads guilty to. Prosecutors can offer not just to have a favorable sentencing recommendation, um, they can also offer to drop charges um, in return for a guilty plea. So sentence differentials is a big piece of leverage that affects people's decisions whether to plead guilty and engage in plea bargaining. Um, detention is another big piece of this. This usually comes into play with pretrial detention, right? People who've been accused with, accused of a crime, but they haven't yet been convicted. If they're being held pretrial, that pretrial detention can sometimes be um, uh, it can exert a lot of pressure for them to plead guilty, especially if a guilty plea is going to get them out of detention. So that happens more often in less serious cases where a prosecutor would be willing to give, um, you know, a defendant a plea to, that would be like time served, for example. Um, but it can also happen in very serious cases, especially serious cases where um, a defendant's been convicted, but then the conviction has been overturned on appeal. And a prosecutor, we've seen actually lots of examples of this, a, a conviction gets overturned on appeal. It looks like for reasons of factual innocence, it looks like you know there's a lot of reason to believe that this defendant actually wasn't guilty. And prosecutors will often deal with those cases by offering a very attractive plea bargain to time served. And so the person who's sitting in jail will say, yes, please let me out of jail, even if he or she believed that they, they are innocent and might have won on retrial. And in fact, I think this idea, right, what's going to convince an innocent person to plead guilty is really something to focus on. I could, and I would be happy to if you would like me to, talk about the principled case against plea bargaining, why it's problematic in a system that's supposed to require proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and in a system that's supposed to offer everyone, innocent or guilty, a trial in front of a jury of their peers, um, I'm happy to give you that discussion. Um, but I think that it's really very, very, very important to make sure that the leverage that exists in plea bargaining isn't used to convict people who are innocent. There are a couple of things that I think could be kept in mind to try to especially reduce the pressure on innocent people to plead guilty. Um, one of them is, again, about these sentencing differentials. Uh, we could, if you wanted to, talk about the sort of the calculus that someone does of an expected punishment, which is essentially the chances of them being convicted multiplied times uh, the expected, the, the sentence upon conviction, that's their expected punishment. This is like, if you have those friends who do math about when it makes financial sense to buy a lottery ticket, your expected return, it's that sort of thing, except it's amount of time in jail. So you can have a prosecutor who thinks that there is a person with a very, very, very good chance of acquittal if they make the offer good enough, even somebody who um, who has a very high high rate of acquittal, they can make the expected punish lo punishment low enough that the person still pleads guilty. Um, discovery is something that a lot of places don't give defendants access to when they're pleading guilty. Um, even in states where defendants are entitled to discovery, prosecutors are often able to bargain around the discovery issues. 
Um, to the extent that you believe in plea bargaining and that you believe that plea bargaining is an efficient way to run the criminal justice system, it's difficult to defend an efficiency argument where one side of the bargaining doesn't have access to the factual information they would need to make an appropriate decision. Um, and then uh, I don't want to I don't want to keep talking too too long because I know we have to hear from other people. But I'll just say that sometimes the calculus for people who are facing less serious crimes, the problem actually isn't the difference between what would happen to them if they were convicted and what would happen if they were acquitted. It's actually the fact that there's not that much of a difference. Right. That it's a giant hassle for them to keep coming back to court for court appearances. Um, that if they plead guilty or get convicted. The, the consequences are, are only minorly different. And it's that hassle of making them come back all of the time, what some people call sort of like the process is the punishment that might cause them to plead guilty, right? Having to miss work and so on and so forth. So you have some recommendations from me and from um, the staff about re uh, reform proposals that could help better account for plea bargaining and reduce the, the sort of coercive effects of plea bargaining. Um, but I'll I'll go ahead and, and stop here and uh, and let you continue. All right, let's move on to Professor Lerman. Thank you so much, and thank you for um, inviting me today. Uh, I want to echo a lot of um, what Carissa just mentioned. I think um, that it, that was a beautiful overview of all of the ways that. Um, in particular, these extra legal pressures matter. So, right, the typical thinking, at least in the um, the kind of logic is that if, if a settlement doesn't make both parties to a criminal case better off, then somebody would invoke their right to trial. And right, this idea of a rational calculation, I think, is um, is stands so much at odds with what we see um, in the research, in the data, in the kind of conversations that we're having with, um, with individuals as they're making the decision about whether to plead. Um, and really, people are pleading guilty, not necessarily because they're guilty or because they don't want to go to trial, but because they don't want to stay in jail or they don't want to go to jail or they don't want to go through the process. And these sort of extra legal considerations, um, I think, are are incredibly significant and have real implications for how we're thinking about the kinds of um, reforms that um, that are possible. So we have a study where we did um, a, a little over 50 in-depth interviews with um, folks who were in the process actually of um, considering a plea bargain to get a sense of what were the considerations that they were employing when they were thinking about whether to accept a, a plea deal. Um, and then we also spoke to um, about a dozen defense attorneys uh, about their sort of uh, their process of walking someone through a, a, a plea bargain arrangement. We also looked at um, the state court processing statistics as a, a sample of cases um, from 40 jurisdictions to think a little bit about um, exactly some of the questions that Carissa mentioned around particularly pretrial detention and the role of jail. Um, uh, many of the people we talked to, particularly in the Bronx in New York, called it bullpen therapy, right? The, the idea that you will do whatever is required in order to get out of jail. Um, we spoke particularly to um, uh, some people who are coming out of Rikers uh, who essentially said it really has nothing to do with what you think the, um, the outcome will be um, as long as you can avoid going back. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really important is that, that, that pretrial detention in particular imposes both emotional and financial hardships, especially for those who are um, already low income, who have prior records, um, and arguably um, individuals who might do best at trial because the pleas that they're offered might be better, um, right, where the... Um, where it's in everybody's interest to just get rid of it. So, um, you know, we heard from a lot of the attorneys that we spoke with for a lot of people taking a day off from job or childcare is actually a much worse consequence than taking whatever plea they're mm -hmm. offered, even if they um, uh, like firmly believe that they're guilty and even if they're, uh, that they're not guilty and even if their attorney like fully agrees that the evidence is really thin. Um, the Right. So being held in um, in jail, right, uh, if you are the primary breadwinner, if you are a single parent um, yeah, and you, got, you we, often we can... get this, we, we've done a yeah. lot of pretrial work. So I, we totally yeah. get that problem. Yeah. And so I think one of the big questions is, like, how do we um, how do we think about the um, the kind of big picture? And I think, you know, AB 2418, thinking about just better data on plea bargains. I know this came up in the last session. I think it's really critical. This, uh, you know, how do we start to track what happens here? Um, 
But I also think, you know, there's a there's a feedback effect here. Um, one of the things that we heard a great deal was uh, the kind of undermining of systemic legitimacy and really thinking about the role that plea bargaining in particular plays rather than empowering individuals to make choices. It's really undermining how people think about justice within the process um, and arguably, right, because of um, the sort of discovery question that Dr. Hessing mentioned, um, right, does actually undermine the ability to for transparency and accountability. And so I think there's a couple of um, there's a couple of sort of process uh, changes that you might imagine um, are really critical here, right? Limiting pretrial detention, that's an obvious one. Really paying attention to conditions of confinement. So to the extent that jail conditions and jail monitoring are part of why people are willing to plead, um, at, right? Thinking about that question. Um, but also, right, sort of better documentation. And I think that's where the data question comes in, right? Requirements that prosecutors collect and share data. And I think it remains to be seen whether the um, fairly limited data that are collected um, through 2014 will, right, will be enough that you can answer the kind of critical questions around how particularly differential impacts across individuals with different kinds of um, criminal histories or different cases, um, right? Uh, there have been recommendations in the literature about mandating some kind of formal phase during which each party has to present their version of events for the record so that you're actually doing better documentation and then sharing that documentation. And then ultimately, um, you know, I, I think I would second the the conversation needs to be had about whether, um, right, this sort of efficiency argument around plea bargaining um, is actually an argument for rethinking it all together. Um, and that that's a um, that that's a conversation that needs to be had. OK, I, th this is all super interesting. Let me unpack what you were or let me what were you getting at just there, Amy? Then I think the right the extent to which we think of plea bargaining as an a, a kind of efficiency and you know there have been estimates that if you increased uh, you know the the if you decrease plea bargaining ten percent you then you increase by a hundred percent the the kind of uh, capacity needs that's a really terrible argument for how to do justice and oh um, just, and but, I think this yeah okay I agree that the only reason to do this is because it makes everything more efficient. Yes. Right. Okay. I think we're on the same page with that. I um, imagine. Yeah. Um, all right. So I like the way that Carissa, you had sort of separated these out as two separate the problems that you have identified two separate issues. There's the trial tax issue with the long sentences, long exposure cases. I'm going to put that aside for a second. I do think that's interesting. I probably come back to it. But I'm sort of more interested in the or want to start off at least with um short sentences or the short exposure and the you know the incredible incentives to just get out of jail regardless of guilt or innocence and you've already sort of basically served your time and so um i remember seeing that when i was just in law school and i was kind of absolutely floored by the system by that um and i guess and amy you had touched on this is the solution to that um less pretrial detention I mean, is that just, is it, is, it, is it as long and short as that? Is, or is there other ways to approach this problem? Yes. I, I mean, I'm sure there are other ways to approach the problem, but that's a, I mean, that's a really good place to start. Um, I think the the primary pressure of pretrial, it, it, if you could limit that, you'd go a long way towards um, sort of changing this equation. Carissa, do you have other suggestions on how we might, I mean, I get it. It make, makes, of course, it makes sense. It, it eliminates the, the whole incentive that we were talking about, that people plead guilty in the first place for this. Are there other ways that we might be to address this particular problem? Yes. So I'd say that, um, I'd say really reducing pretrial detention, detention is a necessary but not sufficient way to address this because if you have people in custody, they're being offered the chance to get out if they plead. So that's a that's a pretty clear calculus. What's maybe less clear is what happens to the people if they're not being held pre-trial during the pre-trial process. And that process is actually incredibly onerous as well, right? So don't get me wrong. If I'm facing murder charges, I'm going to happily, not happily, but I will go to court for all of the pre-trial conferences 
rather than say I committed a murder if I hadn't committed a murder. But if I'm being accused of something that's much less significant than that, having to attend a series of pretrial conferences, the chances of missing one of those pretrial conferences and suddenly having a bench warrant out for me, that's a different calculus, right? If the, if the difference is you know, a $500 difference in my fine, it might be economically inefficient for me to keep going to court because I have to keep taking off days from work and so on and so forth. So we really don't, it, it, pretrial detention would be a huge step, but I don't think it's enough because I think even the people who are out find them and, and look, I, I wrote a book about plea bargaining. I suspect that's why I'm here. <laughs> There's a horrible story in the book about a young man who was arrested for trespassing in his own apartment building and he pleaded guilty to trespassing in his own apartment building because the system was not set up for him to have be able to just send his lawyer in with a photocopy of ID proving that he lived in the building. He would have had to take off another day of work to go in and do this thing. So it seems maybe strange to talk about how we should be focused on the inconvenience of people and having to participate in the criminal justice process. But the truth is when the stakes are this low, people participation is sort of too high of a cost. And I'll just say, what's the solution? You can waive people's pretrial appearances. Um, I talk about a judge in Ohio who did this. Um, you could also try to adopt systems that don't look like this. I don't know a ton about them, but in England, they have these things called cautions, which are basically like the police saying, don't do this again. And it's formal and it's on your record, but it's not a conviction, right? So people understand what's going on. The police thought you did something bad enough that it warranted a caution. And you can fight the caution if you want to, but there's no pretending that the sort of the full due process and sort of majesty of the criminal justice system sort of came to bear about that minor matter. And, and I should add one last thing, and I'm sorry. When no. we're talking about these minor crimes, I'm really, really, really glad that Amy brought up the idea of efficiency because there's reason to think that if these cases had to go to trial, what we wouldn't see is an uptick in trial, we would see more dismissals. And I have some statistics from these courts in Utah where the trial penalty was essentially dispensed with in these sort of lower courts and the, the, the result was not more trials, it was significantly more dismissals. Because at the end of the day, right, I mean, we keep talking, we, we've talked a bit about the cost benefit analysis for the defendant, but there's also a question about the cost benefit analysis for the state and for the prosecutors. Like the, if, if it's cheap to convict people of these low level crimes, then the cost benefit analysis is very simple. It's whatever paperwork it takes. If it is more expensive so, to go through the process, then you might think it's not worth it. For example, you know, in the Utah situation, how did they get more trials in these low-level cases? How did they? Oh, it's complicated, but it's basically this. They had these courts. They were called justice courts. I don't, I'm not admitted to practice in California, so you'll have to forgive me. I have only a few things to say that are California specific. Um, but so they, they're these, there are these courts. They're not courts of record. In order to be able to convict people, the sort of, the procedural due process um, deal that they struck was um, you got a trial de novo if you got convicted. It was These courts existed only for B and C class misdemeanors. You could get a trial de novo and there was a cap. You couldn't get anything more serious, like any sentence that was worse than the sentence that you got in the justice courts. So there was no caught, like no trial penalty for invoking the right to trial. Um, and so people pleaded guilty at a lower rate, but rather than having the trials proceed, the prosecutors responded by dismissing. In many cases, in many cases, the trial rate was twice what it was in the district court, but that is to say it was one point something percent instead of 0.9. Got it. Committee members, do you guys have any thoughts or questions before? on these, especially on these low level. Yeah, I have a question about kind of this discovery point. 
Um, and it, this is a blind spot for me in California's process. And I know there was a bill in the legislature this last year carried by Senator Steve Bradford around discovery. And when you have access to it, do folks who are facing charges have access to discovery before a plea deal right now? So, Tom, you should weigh in here, but I, I believe that you have it's the rule is 30 days before trial. But obviously, yeah. go ahead, Tom, you want to. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think it's it's not a, a clear yes or no. It depends upon where you are in the process and how much of the discovery you get. You know, you'll get typically some indication, you know, um, early on, especially if there's a preliminary hearing, but you won't sort of have 100 percent of everything until um, right that deadline that that Mike mentioned. Is there would there be any efficacy in tying tying this to plea deal offerings, plea offerings at all? In terms um, of the kind of quality and substance of information that's been passed over to the defense? It's it's a it's a very common um remedy suggested for the situation. Um I think it's it's practically very difficult. New York, you know, recently changed their discovery laws and the prosecutors there will tell you that the world came very close to ending. Um, whether that's true or not, I think so it was probably a good change, you know? <laughs> well, I think it was rolled back also. So and, and in California, we also have the um, the added difficulty that it would take a two thirds vote, I believe, to do anything significant. But we can put that aside, certainly. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, I'd love maybe Rick might also want to chime in on this. I think discovery matters a lot. And a lot of times it also is confirmation you should probably plead guilty as quickly as possible. Um, so I don't think it's an unalloyed, uh, it goes in one direction or, or the other. It depends on the case, you know. Um, but sometimes getting six more police reports saying the same thing doesn't necessarily convince you you should go to trial. Uh, and obviously that is um, uh, very, very different um, per, per case. And there's, you know, as with all this stuff, exceptions and, and different arguments you can make. But that's why on the staff side, we stayed away from it um, a little bit for, for this. Those are some of the things we were thinking. Understood. But if I could jump back in for a second, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And then we'll so, go to um, uh, Justice Maria. Go ahead. Go ahead, Carissa. So just, just really quickly, um, I think discovery reform is incredibly important. Um, I think that prosecutors, when there's material that would induce someone to plead guilty, they share it readily with the defense. The question is whether the materials that suggest the person should insist on a trial get shared, and there's reason to suggest that the answer to that is no. Um, but more importantly, and this is where it's important to think about plea bargaining, it's not enough to say that a defendant would be entitled to discovery because one of the um, one of the tricks about plea bargaining is because it's treated as a negotiation between the two parties, prosecutors can simply require that a defendant waive their right to discovery in order to get the plea deal. And there's, um, I think, what I can only describe as a, as a cautionary tale, um, horror story out of Arizona, where Arizona decided to implement exactly the sort of discovery rule that you talked about, that defendants were entitled to discovery within, I forget, 30 days of indictment. And so the Maricopa County Attorney's Office uh, now has a formal program where they, um, uh, they uh, wait to indict people until they've offered them a plea deal. And if they don't accept the plea deal, then they indict them and they won't offer them a plea deal. And the ACLU is challenging it and they're losing because the Supreme Court has said that plea bargaining is about negotiations between parties and defendants are free to waive or not waive. So if you wanted to make sure that the defendants got their discovery, my recommendation would be a change in the rules directed at judges, which is that judges would not be, would have would not be permitted to accept a guilty plea unless there's a representation on the record that the defendants then provided with all of the materials that gets around the plea bargaining loophole. And you know, and this could also so be something so that, that might go sure on that the, the list of eliminate us. the waiver of discovery. You would just eliminate that. All right, Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt. And then we'll go to Justice Moreno. I was going to say this could be something that could be part of um, sort of to the discussion we we're having earlier about incentives, you know, uh, for prosecutors could voluntarily do a lot of this stuff. I mean, not, I think there are some privacy concerns with some of it, but um, 
it might be something that if they opted to do would avoid a lot of the uh, issues we're talking about. Justice Marina, you had a question? Yeah, just uh, just three three comments. Uh, and, and I may be living in an idealistic unre and unrealistic uh, world since I've been you know, out of the trial courts for like 25 years. But uh, one, in California, we have 977 to, you know, for out of custody uh, appearances in misdemeanor cases. And that can resolve the, the pressure that's imposed on a defendant to plead and eliminate the need to come into court. But to me, that isn't really the, the real issue with respect to delay in getting cases to be uh, resolved. First of all, I agree with the comments made on having a, a timely and complete discovery. Uh, that places an enormous burden on the prosecution. Uh, and, you know, whatever sanctions could be imposed either by, by statute or by, by courts on making sure that that's done, as I said, timely and complete, can give uh, the defendants, you know, more information upon which to to fashion some kind of a plea deal or disposition of the case. But I think the most, and, and that would include Brady information, not just stuff that obviously favors uh, the prosecution and sanctions imposed for not turning that over uh, in a timely, complete manner. But the third thing I think is the most important is that judges really have an obligation to manage their, their, their calendar efficiently. Uh, and uh, I mean, this goes back to the days, I think, in the maybe early 90s, late 80s, where, you know, California imposed the, you know, no continuance without a uh, good cause. I lived through that, and many cases got, got uh, uh, resolved uh, when judges complied and, 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 and required good cause for any, any kind of continuance, whether it was in custody or, or out of custody. So there are, as I recall, uh, you know, benchmarks, whether it's 30 days or 45 days, depending on whether or not a person is in, is in custody or not, much like what's going on in the Trump case in, in, in Georgia, you know, no, no time waiver. So I think judges should really take control of their courtrooms and, and not willy-nilly, you know, grant uh, continuances. Uh, the quickest thing to a disposition is to have a timely trial within those within those uh, uh, dates. And we've all heard of situations where cases, my, I'm just talking about minor offenses, have been continued for months on end without good cause, lawyers not ready, prosecutions not ready. But the courts really have to take control of those situations and run an efficient uh, uh, courtroom. I mean, those statutes on time waivers or, or good cause for continuance are there for a purpose. And, and it's my view that if, if the courts took control and managed their courtrooms in an efficient way, that we could really uh, address, uh, you know, the delays that are inherent in so many of our, our trial courts. Again, it's been a while and I may not be realistic about my approach to this, but certainly that's the way if I were back on the bench, that's the way I would I would try to manage uh, my courtroom, particularly as we're discussing now on, on uh, minor offenses. There are other ways of addressing the issues that have been pointed out. I'm, I'm all in favor of those, but I think unless the, the judges take control of the courtroom, we're just sort of just deferring a real solution. So that's my observation. Amy or Chris, do you have any reaction to that? I, I mean, I agree. I um, When I talk to judges uh, and they talk to me about plea bargaining, they tell me that this is really a matter between the parties. And, um, and I'm always struck by um, that seems like an odd thing to say where there's a judgment of conviction being entered that requires the judicial power. I think requiring judges to play a more active role in scrutinizing and signing off on plea bargains would be a benefit. There's a cost to them in terms of time, but I, if you, if you want a criminal conviction of someone, I, I just don't think 
that will take too much effort should be as persuasive as an argument as it seems to be. How would you do that? How would you require the judges to play a more active role? I mean, so there are judges now who won't, not a lot of them, but a couple of them who won't accept a guilty plea until they've asked a ton of questions about the record, but more importantly, until they've gotten representations on the record from the prosecutor about what the evidence looks like and what's been turned over to the defendants. So, um, right. I understand that there's pro judges who, you know, have a ton of discretion on how they run their cases. From a state's perspective, how would you imagine a statute that would yeah, so I assume you guys have a court rule that tells the judge what they have to inquire about before they can accept a plea agreement. And so whatever you want that to be, representations from the parties about X could be part of that rule. And representation and particularly representations about what evidence has been disclosed. I mean, you think that that's and you think that what that evidence, mm -hmm. and that, that alone, even exists, if they just say and, I, I haven't disclosed everything, but they but the other side says it's OK, we've we waive disclosure. I, or you would say we don't we don't allow. I mean, here's a here's a big problem, right? If if you say we're gonna eliminate waiver of disclosures, they have to disclose everything, you're gonna have a long time uh to adjudicate these cases. It's gonna extend the time, even the cases that everybody wants to get out of jail, and everybody's fine with a shorter amount of time in jail, especially the defendant. But you'd say you'd sacrifice that for having a more transparent discovery. If you're asking me, yes, I think asking the you. prosecutor is getting ready to offer something that allows a defendant to get out of jail. The defendant should be let out of jail before having to decide whether to accept that. Hmm. All right, so you're saying, um, Okay. Because that should be a pretrial release. If you were willing to release this person anyway under this deal, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Just just one other obs observation. You know, having practiced or presided in courts, both in federal and state court, when I went to the federal court, as we just saw in the Hunter Biden case, judges are, are very particular about obtaining a factual basis for the plea. But in state court, it's, you know, if you just stipulate to a factual basis or you stipulate to a factual basis based upon the police report, but generally because of the volume of cases, state court judges really don't go into detail on getting a factual basis for the plea. It's, it's just very uh, routine. I, I think to ensure integrity of a plea, a judge should inquire in more detail, just like in federal court, as to you know, why and what's the basis for the defendant uh, entering entering a plea. I wrote an opinion on this that I don't think got much attention, but the practices in both courts, both types of courts are, are, are very distinct. Uh, so if there's a concern about, you know, whether the defendant has all the information of what he's pleading guilty to, getting a uh, an oral admission from them that yes i did this i did this i did that i mean that i think would ensure that you know the court would accept the plea but that's just not not the practice in, in state court i don't know what the resolution is to that it can be refined by statute or something else but there's a there's a complete difference between taking a plea in both courts and ensuring that the defendant fully understands what he's pleading guilty to. I understand the procedural justice and the procedural rationale for having the full plea, you know, on the record. Kirsi, you had sort of suggested at the top that you could discuss a little bit. Is there a practical benefit, do you think? And by practical, I mean, um, Maintaining the right, I don't know what I'm, go ahead. You were shaking your head. No, I wasn't shaking my head, I was just listening. Oh, no, no, Carissa, I was sorry. Oh, I oh. I'm sorry, you're saying what's the practical benefit of having this sort of elaborate factual basis on the record? Oh yeah, there's a there's a big benefit, which is one of the, 
one of the strange, in my opinion, strange things about people at plea bargaining is people often depend the, defend the practice, not just on efficiency grounds, but on the grounds that it allows us to convict people that we otherwise wouldn't be able to convict at trial. And so um, the conviction doesn't give us to sound sort of silly, for, I don't know, to sound naive, it doesn't give us the truth, right? So it doesn't, you know, somebody's somebody's accused of a serious sex crimes and pleads guilty to an assault charge that has nothing to do with sex. How should that be treated? Well, we have, you know, formal consequences that aren't being triggered because the person's not pleading guilty to a sex crime. But at the same time, if that person is ever arrested again in the future, what should the next judge think about this past conviction? Did they punch somebody on the street or did they rape somebody, but the state couldn't prove it? Now, if you ask me, we... <laughs> It's, it's like we're like in the upside down world if we're talking about what a conviction for, should look like for somebody whose guilt we can't prove. But unfortunately, that's the reality of, of sort of where we are. So I think trying to get a factual basis on the record that the parties are willing to agree to, right? These are the facts that we will agree to as true can have practical benefits in, in the future. And, and I'm sorry, this takes us off topic, but when I was preparing for my remarks today and I read the staff memo, um, I looked up some information about Prop 8 and the sort of prohibition of plea bargaining, which obviously isn't, you know, isn't observed. But the section of the California Penal Code that prohibits plea bargaining says that, that plea bargaining in serious cases is prohibited unless there's an insufficient, unless there is insufficient evidence to prove the people's case or the testimony of a material witness cannot be obtained. I don't know what you guys can do because I don't know how much of that was enacted by by you know the people through the, the proposition process, but it strikes me as bad to have a law on your books that says go ahead and plea bargain if you can't prove someone's guilt. That yeah. might be that might be why people support plea bargaining, but it strikes me as I don't know, unconstitutional to say, here's how you convict someone when you can't prove that they're guilty. And I just, and I would love to add just really quickly, I think the the other, um, there's an individual logic of being able to look at past cases and actually having some stipulations on the record, but there's also a systemic um, sort of rationale that if you have like more, more information about what kinds of evidence would have come up potentially if it came to trial, um, what the, um, what the stipulated kind of stipulated facts were, you could actually do much more um, for thinking about how plea bargains are working, how they're working differentially for different kinds of cases. Um, and it, it, this sort of, um, how different uh, police departments are are changing their decisions. One of the things that came up a lot in the conversations we had was this question of police accountability and really thinking about the kinds of things that people will say, like, you know, I, if this went to trial, uh, it would have been shown that the police like really had no uh, kind of no reason to stop me in the first place, but because it's all sort of swept under through the plea bargain, that never gets documented anywhere. And so I think we lose this opportunity to, you know, at least have basic information at, at a systems level that we could think about looking at over time and geographic variation. Interesting. Interesting. All right. We're running short on time. We spent a lot of time on these short cases that I think I'm, I'm particularly interested in, but to, on the chart, what's called the trial tax problem. Um, I was wondering if either of you guys have specific recommendations that you think have worked elsewhere, particularly that might've been enacted elsewhere that work, um, or we kind of just, anyway, suggest, or maybe we have to make something up. I have to say, I haven't seen a good pattern for this because there's just this fundamental tension that in trying to reduce the pressure on people to plead guilty, it also necessarily lengthens sentence. So I think the same people who worry about people being pressured into pleading guilty also would prefer to minimize the amount of time that people spend incarcerated. And those two things are just fundamentally in tension with one another. And I don't personally know how to reconcile them. So are there places out there that have adopted certain approaches? Yes, there are, but I, I don't know that there's any that I could personally recommend. Yeah, 
Amy? Yeah, I would say the same. I mean, are there ways that, you know, sometimes I know that when we get to sentencing, you know, um, defense attorneys will say, well, they've offered with, you know, I know I was convicted, but they offered four years or whatever. They offered some. And is there some way to bake that into the system or to require juries perhaps to even be aware of that information or lesser included offenses, for example? I don't know if those are sort of automatically baked into the system Are any of those ideas you think useful. I mean, if you want to tell the jury what the plea offer was, you could. You could also tell the jury what sentence the person is facing if they're convicted. Now, the downside of that is that it invites nullification or the upside of that, right? It depends on your view about things. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a school of thought that says that the jury should have all of this information um, at their fingertips so that they can make a decision. But that requires a certain view about what the jury decision-making process is supposed to accomplish. And do, do you know if there's, are, have there been research on, on that particular issue? Oh, on what happens with an informed jury? Oh, I mean, I don't know about like, res I don't know about like formal like research with controls and those sorts of things, but it's generally accepted as true that if the jury thinks that the penalty will be too high, that they'll acquit. And what people usually point to there is um, England in like the 1800s where everything carried capital punishment. And so there were there were incredibly high acquittal rates and that what was called pious perjury where they'd be like, oh yeah, no, he definitely did steal all of that stuff. Let's say it was only worth five shillings because that gets him under the capital threshold. So we have lots of reasons to think it's true, but I'm not aware of any sort of like, you know, systematized social science research that's looked into it. Maybe. I don't either, but this does strike me as one of those areas with massive potential for unintended consequences, right? The uh, If the, that is information that is going to be made available to juries, it totally changes the calculation of what to offer because you're aware that that then is, can be strategic one step down the road. So um, I would be really cautious about thinking that that's a sort of path forward. How about requiring presentation of, of um, lesser included offenses. How, 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 what is the rule now, Tom or Rick or Joy, California? So there's uh, Senator, Skinner. Senator Skinner at her hand. I don't know if you want to address that first. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. Tom, you should answer it. But I think, obviously, not being a lawyer myself, I don't, uh, other than my experience on the Public Safety Committee and this commission, uh, you know, I can't speak with technical knowledge, but I think that a good amount of California law and California practice varies a great deal, um, Carissa, from what you were describing. So mm -hmm. some of your, some of the concepts that you're suggesting may work elsewhere, but would probably not be uh, um, as appropriate here. I mean, the, the issue around like a second, a second offense being pled down is usually because of an evidence problem. Um, and of course the judge has all the information anyway, cause they're given a file. So uh, there's just um, some aspects of what you were describing that I don't think would are, are translatable for either our practice or our current law. But Tom, you have to speak to it more specifically. Well, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get into this when we, I think, when we present the staff proposals. But we've tried to sort of translate um, a lot of the work that uh, Professor Hessig and others have done sort of into the California context a little bit. It, it's very hard, though. I, I think uh, that's one thing we can all agree on. This is a very tricky. But Mike, on the sort of lesser included, lesser related. So lesser included offenses, um, this is something where it's super, super technical. And even I think a lot of lawyers have a hard time understanding it. So lesser included offenses, that's like, if you're charged with burglary in the first degree, you've necessarily committed burglary in the second degree. You can imagine like a concentric circle, like a lesser included is completely within a bigger circle. And in those instances, you have the right to request the jury to um, convict you of that. The, the concept that we were exploring in the staff proposal was something that California did for around 15 years called lesser related. So it'd be like not burglary, but trespass, which is technically has doesn't quite fit. It's more of a Den Venn diagram than a concentric, concentric circle, but it would allow a jury to say, well, what actually happened here? Maybe it wasn't quite burglary, but it was a trespass. So we're going to convict of that, which is obviously a much less serious offense, but might be um, more of the truth of what happened. But under current law, they wouldn't have that option. It would be all or nothing. 
Um, so sort of restoring this practice of lesser related offenses, which again, we can get into um, more now or, or later or never, um, would sort of give the jury the, the power um, to say, well, let's see what actually happened here and not just default to something much more serious or nothing at all. So I think to to Carissa's or Dr. Hessick's point from, from earlier, thinking about kind of medieval times, then you will, you're less likely then to get the acquittals, more likely uh, higher conviction rate, but probably lower average time, uh, assuming the, the lessers are included. Less I, likely anybody walks because folks feel like they're overcharged and this doesn't fit right. Right. And, and probably more likely to, to try your chance of, at trial because you like it's not going to necessarily be a very serious offense. If, I, if the facts are going to show is just a, a trespass or a misdemeanor or something like that. that, that's the idea behind it. It would sort of remove some of the unfair fear of what would happen after trial if the jury just has these very stark choices. And more likely to get at the truth, right? If it's, right. you know, if it's one's too hot and one's too cold, you know, the porridge in the middle is, seems just right. Hopefully it's more sophisticated than that, but yes, something like that. <laughs> um, all right, does anybody else have any other questions or uh, Dr. Hessig or, yeah, uh, assembly it member Brian. Really briefly, I just appreciate the the transparency and the dichotomy of, of thought that you struggle with, whether to you know increase transparency and information in this space, which could inherently um, lead to longer pretrial incarceration times or or just the recommendation seems like the only recommendation that came from the conversation is pre-trial release should be something we do at a significantly higher rate and it, and i think that that's helpful to us because we've talked about pre-trial issues we haven't really focused specifically on the impact on plea bargaining and you know uh dr as you made this point earlier it especially encourages you know um guilty pleas from innocent people. Um, I, I, Mike, I think that's, that's a good point. A lot of what the committee has recommended would address some of the issues of, of plea bargaining, you know, the sort of more rational, less extreme sentences would you know, take away some of the, you know, fear of what would happen after trial, the pretrial detention, more diversion, I think. So, you know, this is, as you said, the intro, this is sort of at the core of the system. And so it's not surprising that a lot of our recommendations would, would, would get at it. Um, but I think sort of revisiting some of them, particularly around the pretrial detention, which is something that um, staff has, has re recommended a way to do that, make a lot of sense in this context. Um, and there's a lot, ton of research on that particular issue, as Professor Lerman has told us. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I hope that you can keep in touch. We will certainly be back in touch with you as we develop our recommendations. I really appreciate your time. Um, everyone else? Uh, we're going to take a lunch break now. You're also welcome to stay and, and watch the rest of today's hearings. Um, but everybody else, uh, let's take about an hour break. Let's reconvene at, at uh, one o'clock after lunch. It's good to see you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.